Hello and welcome to today's lecture, the High Renaissance and Mannerism in Northern Europe and Spain. Taking a look at the map, we can see that by the early 16th century, Europe's political landscape had realigned. France and the Holy Roman Empire had absorbed the former Burgundian territories we had learned about in previous chapters, which helped them increase their power and their wealth. We'll see that the Spanish end up becoming a very dominant player during the 16th century in Europe, and all of these changes will take place against an extreme backdrop of religious crisis. Of course, that would be the Protestant Reformation of the Catholic Church and Rome's response with the Catholic Counter-Reformation. So some of our main goals are going to be to want to understand the consequences of the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation in terms of the art, understand the diversity of cultures and artistic styles in Spain and Northern Europe, identify some artists from the 16th century in Spain and Northern Europe, and recognize and cite artistic terminology from this period. So let's kick it off here with art in the Holy Roman Empire during the 16th century. We're gonna to wanna to understand German culture and artistic styles, identify representative German artists from the 16th century, and recognize and cite terminology from the period. So beginning here with Matthias Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece, we know that Grunewald was a very famous German painter, and one of his more well-known works is the Eisenhorn altarpiece, which is a large polyptic painting on panel that was commissioned for the Hospital of St. Anthony there in Germany. It reflects the Catholic beliefs in symbolism, such as images with the Lamb of God, and of course the blood of Christ coming out of the lamb, which symbolizes Jesus Christ himself, and that blood is sort of spilling into the chalice. And we see all sorts of different symbols that you know correspond with healing and hope and salvation in terms of the religion. But also we see this darker component, images depicting suffering and disease. Of course, it's a crucifixion scene, um, but Jesus not only has, you know, suffered the wounds of the crucifixion, we can see, you know, the stigmata and of course the crown of thorns, but really all over his flesh, there are uh, pustules and boils uh, that would have been very strikingly reminiscent of the boils of uh, plague and disease from the time period that so many were suffering from. And given its placement in a hospital, we know that it is specifically designed to help address uh, the suffering and the hopelessness uh, that pervaded the region during that time and it's addressing right, the illness and the plagues and also underscoring um, this concept of miraculous healing. In many ways, the painting had therapeutic purposes, uh, affording hope to those who were afflicted. So I mentioned it is a large scale altarpiece, a polyptic, a multiple panel painting that sits on a large credella. This is actually the depiction of it closed. Um, you can see right just to the left of Christ, there is a, a crease there between those panels. And if you open those wings up, you'll quickly notice that the inside of the piece actually is um, a large uh, gilded uh, and painted wooden shrine that was created by another artist in the previous years, Nicholas Hagenauer. And Hagenauer uh, sculpted this, these images in wooden relief, as well as the predella. So we can see at the center there is St. Anthony, whom the hospital is named after. 
surrounded by other saints. And then in the predella, we see an image of Christ surrounded by the 12 apostles. And Grunewald painted these side panels. You can see that when they're closed at the crucifixion scene, when they open, we see other images uh, of saints from biblical narrative as well. All right, so we mentioned the religious crisis between um, you know, Protestant and Catholic uh, views with salvation. We're going to get into that a little bit more. But it's also important to understand another counter-religion that is uh, pretty prominent during the 15th and the 16th century in Northern Europe, and that is the art of witchcraft. Um, so in an age where the lifespan was only about 40 years old, we see that disease, plague, and superstitious fears were pretty commonplace. Which kind of gave an air of um, anxiety and tension to the whole time period. And we see artists like Hans Baldung Green are exploring pretty controversial subject matter explicitly with witchcraft. Uh, within his work. And the subject uh, matter of witchcraft is an interesting one. Of course, what is witchcraft? Will involve magical rituals, secret potions, and devil worship. So, of course, the church condemned the art of witchcraft and subjected uh, the practitioners of witchcraft to forms of torture. So in Hans Baldwin Green's work here, we're seeing just one of the many examples of the subject matter explored with his Witch's Sabbath. And it is a Taurus girl wood cup. So it is a relief uh, block of wood, relief printmaking, where the artist has carved away, you know, the, the image from the, uh, from the block of wood and then inked up the, the wood and then uh, printed over the image. So the ink is sort of sitting on top of the wood in this case. And what we see depicted here is a coven of witches. And we see both a mixture of, you know, young, seductive witches and even the old hag witches. And they are all really gathered around this cauldron that is fuming with some sort of concoction, some sort of spell that's sort of blasting out of it. You can see the witch was sort of stirring the cauldron with a wooden spoon. And flying in the sky, we see another witch um, on a goat. Uh, and, you know, we've got a broomstick there. And she's sort of riding backwards, um, which also kind of alludes to this idea of, you know, this sort of backwards nature. Um, uh, of, of witchcraft, you know, through the lens in which the Catholic Church, you know, viewed it. So Hans Baldung Green doesn't stop there. He continues exploring these macabre themes, and here he features female nudity. It's really highlighted in the um, luminous kind of marble uh, colored um, flesh of the maiden. And we see here death is approaching the maiden as she's admiring her reflection here in a mirror. And then, of course, beside her are images of both an older woman and an infant, which would represent the various stages of uh, life, or the cycles of life. And you can see the warnings pretty clear there with death. He's holding above her head. Uh, the sands of time with an hourglass. So the meaning could be interpreted as that no one succeeds in warding off death. This piece is housed in uh, the museum in uh, Vienna, Austria. It's an oil on wood panel painting. And again, you can really see the affinity for uh, minute detail and uh, glazing techniques and rich color that are so prevalent throughout oil painting in Northern Europe. Okay, continuing on here with artists such as Albrecht 
Durer, uh, known as the Leonardo da Vinci of the North. Now, Albert Durer was famous in his lifetime. He became an international celebrity. And we'll take a look at why that is. Of course, his skills and his techniques were important to his reputation, but also he was a master printmaker. So his images were able to be mass produced and then disseminated more widely, you know, broadly across Europe, which also helps him gain reputation further afield. And he himself also took trips to Italy to study Renaissance art. So, you know, taking grand tour and going to um, other locations, um, learning new technologies, and then bringing that technology back to Northern Europe uh, also helped enhance his reputation and his mastery. He was the first artist to synthesize Northern European stylistic features with intricate details, realistic renderings of objects, symbols that are hidden as everyday objects, and to blend them with these Italian features. We're going to take a look at classical body types, linear perspective, and we see this, of course, in the work of Leonardo da Vinci, with whom he admired very much. He was the first artist to keep a thorough record of his life in forms of self-portrait, treatise on his thoughts, and a diary uh, there in the Northern Renaissance, which also kind of aligns him with Leonardo da Vinci because we know Leonardo da Vinci was an avid sketchbooker, keeping great records and notations and devotions of his thought process and his philosophies behind what he was um, making. And of course, Albrecht Durer is an important graphic artist. He's best known for his engravings with printmaking. He's influenced significantly by Martin Luther, who challenged the Catholic Church to reform its ways via his 95 Theses, which kickstarts the Protestant Reformation. All right, starting here with Albrecht Durer's infamous print uh, known as The Fall of Man depicting Adam and Eve. It is an engraving, so we're looking at an intaglio print. Uh, this form of printmaking is often times when an artist takes a metal plate, usually a copper plate, and incises lines in that plate with what's known as a buren, a sharp, you know, pointy instrument, and carving these lines into the metal plate then allows you know, the artist to ink the plate, wiping the ink so that the ink goes into all the little scratches from the bureau. And then of course, uh, is able to then print the, the image over onto paper, usually by running it through a printing press. Now we know that uh, Gutenberg's um, printing press had been uh, an, a important aspect to um, the idea of you know mass producing not just images but um, of course text and information uh, and so we're going to just continue to see the art of printmaking really you know becoming more uh, widely you know important and also you know the technique just becoming more and more perfected. Albert Durer did you know train as a metalsmith and of course we know him as a excellent draftsman and painter and illustrator. And of course we know that he was an international celebrity. So here we see two figures based on ancient statues. So we see his um, uh, classical studies coming into play, his classical studies of um, the uh, Roman Vitruvian theory of human proportions, which we also see Leonardo da Vinci uh, resurrecting uh, in his work as well. So this observation of nature, um, this uh, tapping into classical knowledge of great thinkers from the past, but we also see a real inventiveness. You know, in the background scene within the forest, we see different kinds of um, creatures and symbolism that's coming through. We see in his infamous Night Devil, Death and the Devil print, we see the knight who's sort of symbolic of, you know, courage and this character who's sort of steadfast as he is, uh, you know, on his steed 
with his trusty dog there walking through this really dark forest surrounded by images of death holding the hourglass and the devil. Now, of course, these images are quite fantastical. And we know that, of course, he tempered his idealization and fantastical imagery with the observation of nature. So we can see it's demonstrated in his well-honed skills in the rendering of all the foliage in the scene and the animals themselves. Even the gnarled bark of the forest trees and the looming dramatic symbols are really enhancing the overall scene. And with this small watercolor sketch, um, we see that he is incredibly interested in science and observation and the mysticism of the natural world around him. He, of course, is embracing the studies of Italian artists who are also interested in the mimesis of nature. So in this botanical illustration, we see him accurately depicting details. And this quote by Durer really is very telling about why he places such an emphasis on the observation of nature. He says, depart not from nature according to your fancy. Imagine to find aught better by yourself. For verily, art is embedded in nature. He who can extract it has it. So he's saying, the better you are with your skills on observing nature, you can combine all sorts of elements together to invent, to be fantastical, to make something, you know, believable beyond reality, beyond you know, this world entering the realm of imagination, but it first has to begin with observation of nature. So nature is the great teacher. And of course, this is coming from um, art, other artists in the Renaissance in Italy, like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, who was a big believer that right, nature was the great teacher. Nature had her own laws, her own theories, and these things could not be you know, uh, separated uh, from, from what was, from reality. So Albert Durer also, of course, is, you know, developing his celebrity and his reputation by producing a number of self-portraits, uh, which were meant to showcase his skill sets, of course, so he could acquire patronage, but also to showcase himself as a successful artist. Um, so here in the self-portrait from 1498 that's on display at the Prado in Madrid in Spain, we see that uh, he paints it a few years after his trip to Italy, which was incredibly influential in his career. Uh, he paints this likeness of himself in an Italian mode. He seated the half-length half portrait composition with a three-quarter view in front of a window with this very classical landscape in the distance. And he's wearing pretty fancy outfit, really fancy, um, you know, animal skinned gloves there. So again, prominently sort of displaying himself as a reputable painter. This scene is markedly pretty different. Uh, we see him set against this really dark monochromatic background, and it's a more of a full frontal uh, composition. It's very sort of imposing in many ways. This was just painted a few years later in 1500. And Durer goes about inscribing the painting really right at eye level. Thus I, Albert Durer from Nuremberg, painted myself with indelible colors at the age of 28 years. So of course we see you know, the focus on his portrait, but the inscription, again, being right there at eye level is also a big you know, proclamation of his identity, about his celebrity, right? About, you know, the painting itself, right? The, the painting itself is even speaking here. And we see the focus also uh, on the hand gesture, which is in reference to the artist's hand as his creative instrument. You can see it's kind of uh, lovingly caressing the fur on the collar of his jacket. Um, and again, just take a look at the realism, the naturalism of that uh, expression in the eyes, um, the skin itself, and the locks of hair. 
Okay, uh, let's examine the Protestant Reformation and take a look at some of the art that comes out of this new um, movement uh, in the Protestant world. Understand the consequences of Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation, which is Rome's response to the Reformation. Observe how Protestantism affected the role and the imagery within art, and what are some varying concerns with the Catholic and Protestant views of salvation? How are these views portrayed in the art during the time? So this is a, a woodcut uh, that is created by Lucas Cranach the Elder, and Lucas Cranach was friends with uh, Martin Luther, who is uh, the figure responsible for writing the 95 Thesis, which set out to uh, demand that the Catholic Church reform its ways. And in this famous woodcut, we see some of the different views you know, of, of salvation between Protestantism and Catholicism. And we see that, you know, to the right, we can see the image of the crucifixion, and we see images of um, what really look like rays of light sort of coming down here uh, onto this um, sinner's, you know, face. And those rays of light are meant to express the concept of uh, God bestowing his grace upon mankind. Of course, in the Christian tradition, the idea of the crucifixion is the idea of salvation itself. Um, you know, the idea that Jesus dies on the cross for mankind's, you know, sins. And uh, through Jesus, there is salvation, you know, redemption, rebirth, everlasting life. So, you know, of course, both Protestants and Catholics believe in, you know, this idea of, you know, Jesus as uh, salvation. But this idea of God's grace um, being bestowed upon somebody um, just, you know, through God's grace is a Protestant view of salvation. Of course, in Catholicism, the idea of good, good works and good deeds were, were important. Um, and Martin Luther had some problems with this. He also had a lot of problems with the concept of indulgences, which were um, you know, pardons for sins committed that, you know, oftentimes took the form of, you know, a monetary form. Um, so, again, there are lots of different uh, views and lots of different challenges taking place. Um, so, of course, let's talk about Martin Luther a little more. Here is an engraving by Lucas Cranach the Elder, one of his close friends, who is an artist. Um, and we know that in Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, this is where he's arguing that faithful individuals would, you know, attain redemption solely through God's grace and affirming that people cannot earn their salvation, but that it's through God's grace alone. And he sort of justifies that through the scripture from Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith alone. We know that Martin Luther, uh, you know, had gone to... Um, school to study law and then eventually later uh, ends up getting into theology uh, you know which really didn't make his father very happy um, but he was you know a very educated man and writing this 95 thesis and nailing it to the church's door in the beginning the church thought oh well you know there's not much there's not much here you know who is this guy but the ideas that Martin Luther had started catching on, and then before long, the Catholic Church couldn't really ignore Martin Luther anymore. And of course, the word itself, you know, Reformation, it is, you know, meaning to reform. You know, so it, it is, um, you know, a type of challenge, right, uh, that the Catholic Church could not ignore eventually had to deal with. Interesting enough, um, Lucas Cranach the Elder 
was also um, exploring other themes, right? We know he was dubbed the painter of the Protestant Reformation, of course, but other kinds of themes included classical mythology, uh, of course, alluding to the Greco-Roman polytheistic past, uh, graphic illustration, and even the nude figure. Of course, I know we've been talking a lot about the importance of the nude figure and different interpretations and different symbolisms of the nude figure in our uh, class discussions. And it is no different here, even amidst the Protestant Reformation. Uh, in this classical Greco-Roman subject, the Judgment of Paris, we see the Greek shepherd is portrayed as a knight in armor. And it's all set within this Saxon landscape. Even the goddesses themselves are loosely based on classical representations of the three graces. So, of course, the, stu the study here with the Judgment of Paris comes from the famous story where we have the uh, three goddesses, you know, Aphrodite or Venus, um, and we have Aphrodite, you know, bribing Paris, the Judge of Paris, uh, to pick her as the most beautiful of the goddesses in this beauty contest as she bribes him with the most beautiful woman at the time would have been Helen, you know, or as Helen of Sparta or Helen of Troy. And of course the other goddesses like Hera say, you know, if you pick me, you know, I'm going to make you you know, uh, the most wise person, and Athena says, if you pick me, I'm going to make you famous on the battlefield, and we know that Paris goes on to pick uh, Aphrodite or Venus because he wants the beautiful woman, and uh, this is sort of the romanticized version of the Trojan War as, you know, told in ancient times. Um, but again, here it is, you know, very stylized and takes place sort of in the context of more of a contemporary time frame with the landscape and the clothing, the sort of Renaissance clothing and armor. We also see an importance with uh, history painting. So we have Albrecht Altdorfer's uh, depiction of the Battle of Isis, and this is um, a landscape combining historical and political subject matter. And he's painting it as really a way to endorse the political belief and propaganda of his patron, who had just embarked on a military campaign against the Ottoman Turks in Constantinople, in present day Istanbul and Turkey. And his patron wanted Althorfer to paint this ancient battle showcasing Alexander the Great, who was the son of a Macedonian king, together with the Greeks, defeated the Persian Empire there at the Battle of Essos. So you can see it's quite an inventive piece. Altdorf showcases the whole battle taking place from a bird's eye view. We can see the armies sort of clashing together we see these crazy mountains, the swirling clouds, the blazing sun is sort of setting in the sky, probably referencing, you know, Alexander the Great himself, and maybe even, you know, also the Greco-Roman god Apollo. And we see images of, you know, the crescent moon as, you know, symbolic of, um, you know, the religion of Islam. Uh, and we just see again a very sort of invented scene, an invented landscape with an inscription all hovering above there in the sky, kind of in a three-quarter view. We also still have the monarchs, we also still have the kings who are commissioning work, uh, and here we see Henry VIII commissioning the German-born painter Hans Holbein to paint his portrait. Of course, Henry VIII became King of England, and he's most famous for breaking ties with the Catholic Church during his reign, separating the Church of England from 
the papal uh, states. And probably even more so, he's more well known for his dramatic six marriages, some of which resulted in annulment, some of which resulted in beheadings. Um, so you can see here Hans Holbein the Younger painting Henry VIII in his uh, uh, fancy kingly attire. Um, and we can see his um, sort of swollen jowls and his stir stern stare um, as kind of symbols of his authority and his, um, well, let's just say his, his extravagant way of living. He, he was known to be a big spender. Also, Hans Holbein the Younger paints the infamous double portrait of the French ambassadors. And we see Jean de Dantavy and George de Sauve in this painting. Of course, they are ambassadors to France, and they are basically ambassador, ambassadors, diplomats, um, who are uh, scholarly, learned men. It's an oil and temper painting on wood. It is on display in the National Gallery in London there in England. And of course, we know that Hans Holbein is wanting to depict these two characters as humanist scholars, right? We see them surrounded by a collection of objects that reflect their worldliness, that reflect their interest in knowledge and their interest in shaping, cultivating a better world for everybody. But it also includes a very unique and strange anamorphic skull, which is a symbol of the reminder of death. And we are going to take a look at that more Closely. From this angle, it looks like a stretched piece of driftwood, but we will see, in fact, from a different view, it looks like the perfect proportions of a human skull. Now, it is floating in the foreground, so you really can't deny that it's there, but from the frontal view, from the frontal perspective, almost everything else is in perfect proportion. So, we know that, of course, the likeness of the sitters is important, but the symbolism of the objects is important. So, of course, the top of the table there is displaying things like, you know, uh, models of the globe and measurements of time, like with an astrolabe and other kinds of uh, instruments that um, humans use to think about um, the passing of time know, mechanical time, the desire to, you know, understand how the world works. And then down below, we have symbols that allude to the arts, right? So we have, you know, the lute in this, you know, three-quarter, uh, you know, foreshortened perspective, which is also kind of in alignment with the skull there, showcasing, again, you know, Hans Holbein sort of showing off hit the way that he, um, is able to create depth and display objects uh, in sort of, you know, more challenging poses and perspective. And one of the strings of the lute is actually broken. So it's sort of, you know, talking about this discord element, this idea that, that the world isn't really perfect during this time. We have the books, um, you know, we have uh, other things that reference the arts here in this, in this realm. Now, behind them is this beautiful green damask pattern, and in the sliver over here, just behind the curtain, we see a little statue of a crucifix of, of Jesus Christ. So, again, the crucifix is sort of symbolic of salvation, and we have this idea of death, right, hovering in the foreground. And if we take a closer look there, we see if we stand just to the right of the painting, 
the, the skull actually comes into full view uh, as a perfectly proportioned skull. Um, and it's undistorted from that angle. Now this painting might have hung in a stairwell. So the audience might have viewed it you know, from the front and then going up or down the staircase would have had a view of it from a, a different perspective. So, you know, Durer again is being sort of fanciful in the way that he can paint and he's including basically multiple views or multiple paintings within one, but it definitely uh, incorporating the skull, artists did this to serve as reminders of one's mortality. We call this you know, memento mori in Latin, meaning reminder of your mortality. And Holbein may have wanted the viewer to ponder this idea of death and the idea of resurrection, right? Since we do have images of the crucifixion sort of hidden in the background, um, to view these two things simultaneously. So a meditation on death and therefore resurrection. All right, let's talk about art in France during the 16th century. So we want to understand French culture and the artistic styles, identify representative French artists, recognize and cite different terminologies. So starting here with the portrait of King Francis I by Jean Clouet. Clouet's portrait shows the king elegantly dressed, of course. This is, of course, showing off his skills. But we have some flattening of the king's features and a disproportion between his head and really his whole body and even the exaggeration of his shoulders there as really giving, um, you know, a formalized style. The idea of just the, um, you know, formal presence of the king is pretty profound in this. We know that King Francis I was a patron of both painting and sculpture and also the decorative arts and architecture, but he especially loved the Italian masters like artists who we have learned about, Leonardo da Vinci. We know that Leonardo da Vinci worked for King Francis I of France and lived in France and died in France at the end of his life. King Francis, of course, um, you know, lived in, you know, luxurious uh, chateaus, uh, you know, throughout, throughout France, but probably the most famous one here is the Chateau de Chambord. And the Chateau de Chambord is also famous um, years later, um, before the outbreak of World War II, a lot of the art collection of the Louvre and, and other museums um, stored their art in various chateaus throughout France to help preserve them and protect them during the um, you know, rape of Europe by Hitler and the Nazis. So famous works of art that ended up being stored there were the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci and the Via St. Milo from the um, uh, Greek uh, classical past. The Chateau de Chambord is also noteworthy because, of course, I mentioned before, it was the country house for the royalty for King Francis I. But it also you know, reflects his taste for Italian design, so it's sort of modeled after Italian palazzos. But it also has dramatic Gothic roof line, which also speaks to that French, you know, Gothic cathedral style that we had learned so much about in previous chapters. And here's a bird's eye view of the Chateau de Chambord and, you know, part of the Loire Valley there. Okay, let's get into the Netherlands during the 16th century. All right, my favorite here. We're going to look at Dutch culture and different artistic styles. We're going to look at also the importance of genre painting uh, there in uh, the Netherlands. We're going to identify different Dutch artists, also including successful female artists. And we're going to recognize and cite different artistic terminologies. So probably one of the more famous works from the entire chapter is The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. 
And it is a triptych, a three panel painting, oil on wood. And the three scenes depicted really are the scenes from um, Paradise. We see Adam and Eve there in the garden. We see the central panels where a lot of drama is taking place. This represents the earthly realm. And then the far panel represents scenes of hell and damnation. Now, we know that in this fantastic landscape, scores of nude people are cavorting and frolicking about the whole scene. Meanwhile, in the horrors of hell there uh, on the end, we see that there are many depictions of these sinners who are enduring tortures uh, tailored you know, to their conduct right when they're living on earth. Um, and the painting serves as a moralistic warning to sinners. Now, of course, there's, there's going to be a lot of fantastical uh, imagery throughout, and I'll show a few slides of details, um, but really you could spend an entire semester studying all of the figures and the inventiveness, you know, in the scene and the meanings, and the ambiguous meanings within the entire painting itself. But, you know, what is the overall theme? Well, you could definitely say it's serving as a moralistic warning. And it makes sense given the time period, um, given the time period with the, all of the, you know, the religious crisis going on, the religious warfare between, you know, Protestants and Catholics, and um, of course the power structures, even the um, political um, uh, battles that were taking place during the time. Now this is, of course, a triptych. So this is the view of it when the uh, panel is opened up. So of course the interior is very colorful. It's almost gem-like. Um, and the piece is actually on display in the Prado in Madrid in Spain because it had been acquired by King Philip II, you know, in later years. And it actually does go on to influence the works by other Spanish artists and Catalonian artists in the time of surrealism when we get to uh, learning about modernity later with artists like Salvador Dali. Uh, so, you know, Hieronymus Bosch really is just ahead of, ahead of his, his lifetime, you know, really uh, ahead, of, ahead of himself uh, when it comes to fantastical imagery and invention. And he does go on to inspire other uh, painters in modernity later. But again, the subject matter for Hieronymus Bosch would have been very um, serious subject matter for the time period. Uh, so we know that Hieronymus Bosch probably learned how to paint from his family. I mean, his father was a painter and so on. And his life is pretty obscure. His name, Hieronymus Bosch, Bosch refers to Zerhurtgen Bosch, um, or Zen Bosch, uh, which is basically where he's from, but this translates to the forest. So we know him, he had a kind of a hermetic lifestyle, um, and, you know, the again, this sort of goes back to the idea that we don't really know a lot about his interpretation of this painting. Again, he was a very sort of secretive person, but we can see, you know, again, the moralistic warnings and this idea of, of sin and damnation are prevalent throughout the scene. When those side wings are closed, this is actually what the exterior of the painting looks like. So we actually see the exterior panel showing the world during creation, probably on the third day after the addition of plant life, but before the appearance of the animals and humans, which we end up seeing when the panels open. You can actually see a little character up here sort of floating in the upper left-hand corner, which is probably symbolic of, um, you know, the creator uh, character. Okay, let's look at um, some details there of the first panel, um, details of the left panel depicting paradise. Um, and we, so we see, you know, God the Father here, 
looking sort of a little bit like a mad scientist. Of course, he's in this landscape, he's with Adam and Eve, and we see that there's a lot of different references to alchemy, not just in this scene, but really throughout the whole scene. And I just always imagine, you know, Hieronymus Bosch in his studio, you know, playing with his, you know, uh, food, like taking, you know, eggs and eggshells and creating little still lives or taking, you know, the crab legs from his, from his dinner and, you know, rearranging them in these different sort of sculptures and just creating the, the most fantastical, you know, architecture that's sort of set up in this landscape or maybe even, you know, vials and beakers from his, um, from his workshop uh, in the scene. So, you know, the artist sort of as a mad scientist here in the studio is definitely an image that I sort of conjure up when I think of the artist at work. We see that there are other animals, things like elephants and giraffes, animals that definitely are not walking around in Northern Europe. But we know that Hieronymus Bosch probably had access to these uh, 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 detailed depictions of animals through printmaking, through printmaking, through prints um, and books, you know, from libraries. Um, and then, of course, fantastical images of unicorns um, and other less recognizable animals, but also animals that he would have seen every day, birds, fish, you know, things that live in the water, snakes, insects, and so on. The central panel is Earth. Now, all throughout the central panel, we see there's this emphasis on the nude figure. We see pretty much everybody is nude and everybody is sort of frolicking about. There's like all these orgies going on. It's just, you know, a real stampede of, of uh, human, you know, um, I like to call it the parade of humanity. Um, but yeah, just the humanness of, of being human is going on. And we see sort of amidst that, there are images of different fruits. We see like strawberries and other kinds of berries. Here, there's really what almost looks like a pineapple. And we see images of different birds, like in the case of the owl or the uh, mallard duck back here, all throughout the scene. Nothing is painted to scale. I mean, everything is really completely stylized and sim symbolic. However, the affinity for the minute detail is very realistic, right? So we see, you know, the transparency of the um, dome that these lovers are in is so beautifully rendered. We can see how frail and fragile it is. It's about, the glass is about to crack, probably symbolizing this idea of, um, you know, a warning um, that something here is about to, to go wrong. Maybe this is a scene of adultery or this idea of, you know, lust and um, other types of sin are about to take place. Um, the plumage in the owl is quite miraculous. And actually throughout um, Bosch's painting with Garden of Earthly Delights, as well as throughout many of his other paintings, in his you know, rep full repertoire of work that we have, we see lots of images of owls. And owls, of course, we think of owls as, uh, you know, wisdom, as a symbol of wisdom. But, yeah, they are a creature of the night, and in many ways they are serving as, you know, a, a moralistic warning themselves um, of something a little more sinister. Um, also, it has been speculated by different scholars on Bosch that the owl itself might actually represent the forest, um, you know, in Bosch, where Bosch was uh, from, um, you know, so in some ways the owl could be even a self-portrait of him, um, you know, as a, you know, creature of the forest. So that's something to just think about. And then of course, uh, you know, the detail of the right panel in hell. And we know of course, like all good artist Bosch saves the best for last. Um, and we see in hell, 
uh, all of the tortures of hell are set against this backdrop of blackness. This city almost looks like a prison and uh, everything is on fire. And it's important to recognize when Bosch was a teenager, the town in which he lived actually was uh, under siege and was set on fire, um, you know, due to the political and the religious, you know, warfare going on during the time. And, you know, he's living during a time where people are being burned at the stake for being witches and, you know, whether they were practicing witchcraft or not. And, you know, again, towns are being burned down to the ground. There's raping, pillaging, and burning going on everywhere, whether it, you know, be, um, you know, due to, like I said earlier, religious or political reasons. So even though this is a fantastical image of hell, in many ways, it's, it's, subject matter that he really witnessed in his lifetime on earth. So that's something to kind of think about. And all about we're going to see different kinds of tortured um, humans that are, you know, being tortured by demons and different kinds of hybrid animal-like creatures that have beaks and claws and nails and teeth and you name it. And probably one of the more infamous characters is what is known as, you know, the devil in the night chair here. And we see he's essentially a bird-like creature that's sitting on a toilet, a, you know, a latrine chair. And this toilet is sort of like his throne. And he's ingesting human beings and then excreting them out um, into basically a pit of despair. <laughs> and... Of course, we see other wretched humans and they're vomiting into this pit of despair. And in the pit of despair, there are even these reflections of, you know, tortured faces beneath that water filled with vomit and human excrement. So it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And we will definitely take a look at this painting in more detail uh, when we zoom together next class. Like I said, we could spend a whole uh, semester on it. All right, uh, Pieter Arstein, and this is the butcher's stall, an oil painting on wood. A great example of both a genre painting, which is a painting that depicts daily life, so we're kind of looking at, you know, the meat in a, in a meat market, but um, our scene actually combines it with a biblical narrative. So we have, you know, genre painting being combined with biblical narrative here. And what we see in the background is Joseph leading a donkey, which is carrying uh, Mary and the Christ child. So he's balancing, right, images of really what could be considered gluttony. You know, if somebody eats all this meat, they truly would be a glutton um, with allusions to salvation. So again, sort of in alignment here with, you know, moralistic warnings. Of course, gluttony is, you know, one of the seven deadly sins and sort of pairing that against, you know, uh, themes of salvation and you know, biblical narrative, uh, with images of Jesus and of Jesus' life. So, thought-provoking. All right, this is the first known Northern European self-portrait by a woman artist, Katarina von Hemmesting. And she, Katarina von Hemmesting, represents herself as a competent artist in her studio. She is working, she's got brushes in her hand, we can see her palette. We can see she's using a mall stick and she's working on a portrait. She's just sort of been interrupted uh, to sort of glance over and look at us. Um, she's shown herself as a competent artist uh, with professionalism and skills that were absolutely desired during this time period. She ran a pretty successful workshop and of course in um, recent years, a lot of scholarly research has gone into studying her, her work and um, putting together the work for, um, you know, large retrospectives so that 
people can understand the importance, you know, that she played during this time period. And again, it's just important to recognize, even though we aren't looking at a lot of paintings by women during the period, it doesn't mean that women weren't good at painting. The problem really arose with the idea of how did women have access to the secret knowledge of painting? Of course, that meant that they had to learn painting just like men did um, from masters, right? They had to go into an apprenticeship, go into a workshop and learn from somebody, uh, spend an enormous amount of time. You know, they had to leave their family behind and go spend time training, right? And in the time period, that's just not something that women did. Women didn't leave their parents and go live with strange men um, because of course the masters would have been men um, if you know a lot of women were painters right uh, and go live with a strange man and learn how to paint from him it just wasn't seen as you know acceptable for a woman and also you know studying things you know like the figure meant studying anatomy and you know women weren't uh you know you know considered to be you know uh, intellectual women weren't uh you know it wasn't considered proper for a woman to be dissecting a corpse you know so again just thinking about uh what all went into studying to be an artist it didn't mean that women weren't capable it just meant that because of the restrictions uh given the the standards that, you know, at the time, that women just weren't given the opportunity. And in the case of Katarina Van Hamison, her father, right, uh, you know, taught her, you know, and that's what we usually see with well-known female painters in the period, is that it's usually their father or a brother or an uncle or somebody in their family that's teaching them. Um, the art form and then they're able to, you know, through the support of an advocate, of a male advocate, they're able to gain um, notoriety. So it's just something to think about. Peter Bruegel the Elder with Hunters in the Snow. Okay, this particular piece I know we want to talk about and be able to formally analyze the mastery with his sense of line and the, the sh contrasting you know, values of the shape and really just the layout of the composition in this uh, genre painting of landscape. And it is a part of a series of landscape paintings that are illustrating the various seasons. There are actually six uh, paintings total. I know there's four seasons, but they, you know, depict, you know, um, early and later parts of certain seasons as well in the cycle. And we see that Peter Bruegel, the elder, draws the viewer diagonally into the expansive scene of winter. So we can really get the idea of the hunters with their dogs in the snow and they're sort of coming back from their hunt. And they're perched up here you know, in the foreground looking down at the rest of the city. And we can see in the background we have um, you know, peasants at work. Uh, P Peter Bruegel, the elder, is um, known as, um, you know, the, the, uh, the peasant painter. You know, he's painting the everyday uh, life um, of peasants. Now, this is interesting. In a lot of these genre paintings, these everyday paintings, these everyday scenes, especially reflecting the everyday life of a peasant, we know that the people commissioning him to paint this are not, you know, peasants who are living in, you know, the countryside. They're, they are wealthy, you know, individuals. And it is, you know, important to recognize here that in Northern Europe, we are again seeing the importance um, that uh, this newly acquired wealth has in terms of, um, uh, of, art, of patrons commissioning artists to make work. But it's interesting. We're seeing these wealthy individuals commissioning an artist to highlight the everyday life of everyday people, peasants. Um, and so sort of giving a voice to peasants uh, and giving a voice to the importance of everyday life and, and, and highlighting the fact that peasants were the ones doing the work, doing the hunting, doing the farming, you know, um, chopping the wood for the fires, you know, for the wealthy people. 
um, that they are really the backbone of the society. And these wealthy people um, are, in a way, highlighting that through the commissions of these particular works. Um, so important to think about. Now, it's the winter time. So what else is going on? Well, you know, the people in the town are enjoying, you know, the winter months. So we can see that in the distance, we see people playing hockey, people ice skating, you know, on the frozen um, pond there. Um, and we see in the distance these mountains, which are almost reminiscent of the Alps. Now, of course, this is interesting because Peter Bruegel the Elder would have traveled south. He did go south to Italy to, you know, to learn, you know, painting, you know, from this Italian perspective. And on that journey, you know, he was enthralled with the landscape, um, the mountainous landscape of the Alps. So this is a very inventive painting. He's sort of, you know, combining, you know, different types of landscape in this scene. And we can see the snow on the branches of the of the wintry, you know, barren trees with the crows kind of flying around in the sky. The shapes, um, you know, we see a contrast, right, of the blackness of the hunters, the dogs, and the trees, and even the birds against the bright whiteness of that winter snow. We see him really placing the emphasis on foreground, middle ground, and background, and the diminution of the size. Just take a look at these four trees right here, you know, big, medium to small, and the diminution of the size, showing a sense of depth and a receding picture plane, which speak to um, his skill, right, and his mastery in um, atmospheric perspective, linear perspective, and depth. All right, art in Spain during the 16th century. So I mentioned at the very beginning of this chapter that Spain is going to become a dominant European state. And we know that these changes are definitely going to be occurring through um, lots of different means, you know, politically, through marriage, marriage alliances, um, and then, of course, religiously, we're going to see, you know, the influence of Spain. Um, so we want to understand Spanish cultures and the artistic styles, identify representative Spanish artists from the period, and recognize and cite artistic terms. So definitely one of the most famous painters who gains a reputation in Spain is the artist El Greco. Now, his name literally means the Greek, and, of course, that is his, that is, you know, his origins. He, you know, uh, utilizes that, you know, Byzantine style that we have learned so much about. And he fuses it with the Italian mannerism that he was learning so much about um, just through his uh, quest for knowledge and stu the study of the art of painting. And he brings all of these elements together in one of his most famous masterpieces, The Burial of Count Orgaz, for the Cathedral of Saint Tome. Uh, and Saint Tome is in Toledo in Spain. And Toledo is you know, you know, the old um, you know, the old capital of Spain before Madrid, it's medieval town. And there is um, this famous uh, portrait which showcases his skill when it comes to, of course, uh, realism, but also this fantastical component. El Greco psychologically divides the space in the painting between the, you know, heavenly celestial realm and then the earthly realm down below. So, of course, um, El Greco is known for his, um, you know, uh, expressive you know, use of color and his real bold contrast and actually loose brushwork. He's really a painter ahead of his time and he's gonna go on to influence other famous Spanish painters that we'll learn about in the subsequent um, uh, Baroque uh, chapters when we get to Baroque Spain with artists like uh, Diego Velazquez. Um, so this loose brushwork, this idea of stylizing the form, right, coming out of this um, mannerist style and then the Byzantine tradition showcasing that emphasis on symbolism, um, you know, the, the spiritual, the kind of the heavenly realm, and the stylization that's sort of related to that. 
And so we see this drama going on there, but in, in really in the psychological division of the space, now we have the earthly realm. If we look a little more closely at that, we actually see the burial of the count, Count Orgaz, down here. And he's seen with all of these different saintly figures. We have characters actually from, um, you know, the parish church, which, you know, the church of Santo Tome, which uh, El Greco was a part of that church. Um, and we see El Greco includes his self-portrait here with these other um, uh, supporters of the church, these other mortal men dressed in black with, you know, various emblems um, on their, uh, on their outfits. And we'll see that we've got the saintly figures, so the spirituals combined with the historical component in his works. The young boy down here to the left represents Al Greco's son. And we see that there is a, you know, kind of earthly narrative here. Portraits of different famous people from, you know, the, uh, the Church of Santo Tome, as well as, you know, biblical narratives. And, you know, he's commemorating the life of this person, right, who is his friend and um, a friend of the church. Uh, so really um, phenomenal in the sense of um, combining the spiritual, you know, the political and the, and the everyday in, into his work. Well, this does conclude the lecture and I had a lot of fun with you all today and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Bye-bye.